Thank you. Uh, Eric de Chassé, Director National Institute of History and Culture, Paris, uh, Jacques Dusset and Henri Matisse, how to collect the collection of cartoons and cartoons. Eric de Chassé, Institute National de History and Culture, Paris, Jacques Dusset and Henri Matisse, how to build a representative collection of cartoons and cartoons. Jacques Dusset and Henri Matisse, how to build a representative collection of prints and paintings. Thank you. Let me thank also um, the Pushkin Museum for this invitation. Uh, I thank in particular uh, Ilya Doroshenko and uh, Soya uh, Sadekova. If you had mentioned the name Jacques Doucet in the first half of the 20th century, in no likelihood, most people would have responded that it was the name of a famous fashion designer. That's the way Doucet appeared in Proust, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, or in the Goncourt Brothers' Diary, a name synonymous both with feminine elegance and a marketing strategy that inaugurated the age and system of haute couture. Some would have spoken about his collection of 18th century art and furniture that had been sold or that was sold in 1912 and raised 13,884,460 francs in total, setting the record for a pre-World War I sale. A smaller number would have known um, that he had become, when he was already rather old, a serious and major collector of avant-garde art, as this information was only made public through an interview with Félix Fénéon, at the time the director of Galerie Bernheim Jeune, more than the adventurous art critic he is most known for today, published in the June 1921 issue of the Bulletin de la Vie Artistique, and right after Doucet's death by a well-illustrated feature in Illustration, we'll see other um, examples of the illustrations in Illustration, about the studio Doucet had started designing for himself and his collection in 1927, and he died in 1929. And a very few specialist, specialized art and literature historians and critics would have known that he had created the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie, the Art and Archaeology Library, in 1908, and the Bibliothèque littéraire Jacques Doucet, the Literature Library Jacques Doucet, in 1916, both given to the University of Paris, respectively, in 1917 and 1929. I might be wrong, because if you check... Well, I thought I had another image. I'm sorry. Because if you check his Wikipedia page in English, uh, it starts today with Jacques Doucet was a French fashion designer and art collector. He is known for his elegant dresses made with flimsy translucent materials in superimposing pastel colors. But at least in our world, the art world or something like the art history world, I think that Jacques Doucet is best known today for uh, as the founder of the two libraries I just mentioned. The first one having become the library of the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art, now located Salle La Brousse, and welcoming many readers who know at least his name through attending the library. And we're speaking about, I mean, we issued in 2018 12,000 reader cards, so it's about this kind of, of public. Uh, some of whom used the Jacques Doucet space for special collections. Then, and maybe equal to the libraries, Doucet is known for the quality and audacity, an aspect I will discuss later, even though in a scarce way, a very picky and choosy way. It's not a large-scale collector. It's a few artworks, but each one chosen very, very carefully. Not that it people who collected in bulk did not do the same all the time, but some of them didn't, um, of his avant-garde collection. Above all, for his acquisition of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Picasso in 1924, but also for a strong group of post-impressionist and early modern paintings, such as Cézanne, Van Gogh, Seurat, Modigliani, and Matisse, and for supporting, not only through buying, but also through helping on a more um, day-to-day -day basis, 
artists linked with Dada and Surrealism, such as the Kiriko, Masson, Miro, Duchamp, and Picabia, and on the image next to uh, Picasso's painting, you can see two paintings by Picabia. Picabia, with whom he seemed to have entertained a real friendship, as well as a whole generation of furniture designers and bookbinders. I'll come back to that later also. Then maybe some specialists know about his 18th century art collection, uh, as it has been thoroughly studied in a book uh, edited by Chantal Georgel and published in 2016 uh, with an INHR uh, research program and a database that's um, available on the website of INHR. And lastly, a few historians of fashion know about his role in this field, which is still vastly understudied, first because he's been completely um, overtaken by uh, the reputation of uh, Poiré in particular, or uh, Worth, uh, and he's been largely forgotten uh, apart from that. But also, I think, because the common take on this aspect of Doucet's life and career, um, popularized by Francois Chapon in his authoritative biography of Doucet, first published in 1983 and which has been republished several times since, is that Doucet was ashamed of being a fashion designer, that he was ashamed of being what in French at the time you called a fournisseur, and that his collecting career in all its guises was more or less a way to make people forget about the supposedly base origin of his fortune. I say that this is largely a reconstruction because if you read uh, Fénéon's interview from 1921, uh, Doucet himself speaks a lot about fashion, speaks a lot about decoration, and of the way he sees some integration between these diverse aspects of his personality. Among Doucet's collection, yeah, so that's the image that was misplaced. I, I, I did that too late yesterday, I guess. Um, a picture by Man Ray, which signals just by the way, I mean, who is taking it, um, who the, the, the owner is. Um, among Doucet's collection, apart from the Demoiselle d'Avignon, one finds a painting by Matisse, Poisson Rouge et Palette, painted in 1914-1915, and now belonging, as the painting by Picasso does, to the New York MoMA. The extent of Doucet's collection of works by Matisse is lesser known, though, uh, and I want now to focus on it. Even if it is nowhere near Shukin's collection of Matisse's, nor that of the Stein family, in terms of quantity, and maybe that's debatable, in terms of quality. I need to emphasize that we still know very little about Doucet's collection of 20th century art. Basically, everybody is just quoting and repeating what has been written by uh, François Chapon, who has an extensive knowledge of the Bibliothèque littéraire Jacques Doucet. He was a director there for uh, nearly half a century, uh, but whose interests veer more towards literature than the visual arts. Um, I still think, I mean, I'm giving some provisional aspects, but I, I still, think that, still think that a lot of things have to be researched. The story we know quite well, because it is featured in André Breton's published correspondence with Doucet, is that of the acquisition of Poisson Rouge et Palette by Doucet. As it is already published, I will only sum it up here. Breton, who is a young, successful writer, inventing surrealism exactly at this moment, um, has just been hired as a librarian and advisor for the Bibliothèque Littéraire. But he also acts more or less spontaneously as an advisor for visual arts, devising lists of works that Doucet should buy, etc. It is he who finds the painting by Matisse at Galerie Paul Guillaume and shows it to Doucet, whom, so the story goes, he is able to persuade that it is a major painting by a major artist, um, as he will later do for Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, so that Doucet buys the painting in 1923, 1924. So the story is a young avant-gardist, knowledgeable, 
an old man knowing nothing with a, a lot of money able to buy one important painting, not painted in 1924, but painted tw 10 years before for various reasons. And I just invite you to read Breton's letter to Doucet to understand that. In general, Doucet is basically portrayed as a, as a stupid rich man uh, able to flush money. And I think it has to do with the fact that he employed a lot of incredibly brilliant young people who at the same time, like Breton and Aragon, for instance, were uh, becoming more and more politicized. And for them, maybe the only way to come to terms with the fact that they were making a living through the money of a rich man while advocating communist revolution in France was to say that, of course, they were just exploiting this uh, poor man. I mean, not poor man, rich man. Um, then the picture was featured, I mean, not really prominently, it's not the, the largest illustration in this feature, um, in Doucet's Rue Saint-James studio, uh, in the, the report that was published after his death in Illustration, the, 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 the widely um, circulated uh, French uh, illustrated magazine, above a cupboard by Paul-Louis Mergier, there'd be much to say about that. We have some correspondence between Doucet and Breton and Doucet and Mergier where, where he's speaking very precisely about how to choose the color and the materials used by Mergier for the cupboard so that it fits with the painting. I'll come back to that aspect a little bit later. So that he thinks he's creating an artwork in itself by using his various uh, abilities in decoration, fashion, um, art collecting and, and building an ensemble with that. Um, and in a frame designed by Pierre Legrand, and now apparently lost. I just want to, to stop for a little minute on, on that aspect. Um, I'm really interested by the, the personality of, of collectors, but I also think that we should not forget that um, they work when they work, even if they want to devise an artwork in itself, and it's clearly what uh, Doucet had in mind for his studio, um, with the works of other artists. And in the end, it is these artists who really matter. And what's interesting is that this um, frame is now lost because I think Matisse insisted that it was particularly ugly. I don't know whether he, he said it to the collector because he sold the painting for a very large amount of money. So I think he didn't complain or anything. We didn't find any trace of his complaints or, or anything. Um, but in a letter to Marie Dormois, who was working for the Bibliothèque Littéraire Jacques Doucet in the 1930s and 1940s, a, a letter that's written in March 1939, he writes that to Marie Dormois. I am happy to learn that Madame Doucet uh, lent her Poisson Rouge to New York, but with its artistic frame, which makes me sick, which makes me sick every time I think about it. And he goes on saying, I hope she sells it, and I hope that the new collector uh, can take it away. And in fact, we know that it was sold in the US through Pierre Matisse, who was Matisse's son. And I suppose that it's at this moment that the, the, the frame was taken away. And I'm always fascinated by this kind of, um, I mean, we now put a lot of emphasis on the original frames and, and all that kind of things. And we are very, I mean, I know for instance that we are very happy that the frame devised by Legrand that fits the painting by Picabia that now is hanging in the uh, collection of the Musée de Grenoble is the so-called original frame. But it is not an original frame. It's a collector's frame. It's just like when collectors put some varnish on their paintings to make them more shiny, contrary to uh, what the artists wanted. I've, I've seen that many times. And one in particular, uh, someone in the room knows of, about it. But. Um, so when the painting was shown in uh, New York, it was then sold 
uh, to uh, Caesar de Hoke in New York, then to Samuel Marx and Florence Shanborn, who bequeathed it to MoMA in 1964, where it has been on display almost continuously since then. What does not appear at all in Breton's correspondence or on anything written about the relationship of Matisse and Doucet, um, what I would call the various stories that have burgeoned from uh, Chapon, is that it wasn't the first painting by Matisse that Doucet bought, far from it. Uh, in fact, it was preceded by at least three other paintings. We don't know for sure that, it, that they are the only four paintings by Matisse that uh, Doucet owned. Um, as we know, through the correspondence between Doucet and Matisse, the very few examples that survive, and maybe there were not more than that because Doucet was a very poor writer, his French is, is very broken, you can see that he was not formally educated, which doesn't um, contradict his incredible um, precision when looking at, liter at contemporary literature. Um, but in one of these letters, in two of these letters, uh, we see that there was some, uh, some prospect of buying works by Matisse in 1913. Uh, there's a letter by the dealer Vignier, who was very close to Doucet, but who was um, um, a dealer in um, Japanese and Chinese art not a dealer in um, avant-garde painting, uh, but who was working with Bernheim Jeune in particular. There's a letter from uh, March 18th, uh, 28th, uh, 1913, where uh, Vignier says to Matisse, um, I sent to Mr. Doucet a summary of our conversation of the other day. That is, that you are thinking of two or three paintings which more or less could fit the desires expressed by this collector, and that as soon as one of them uh, is finished, you will show it uh, to Doucet. The price of one of 8,000 francs has been accepted. Moreover, Mr. Doucet would be very happy to see you, uh, and I um, suggested this to him. So I, I take from this letter, first thing that Matisse and Doucet don't know each other directly in 1913, so it, it seems. And second, uh, that there is this idea to buy some paintings. And we don't know exactly, of course, I mean, till we find something in the archives, if it exists, what exactly Doucet was looking for. Obviously, some paintings were shown or sent to Doucet, as a letter from April 23rd says, I will see Mr. Doucet one of these days and will give you notice of his decision. And maybe, as importantly, um, Doucet owned several drawings and prints, which he seems to have bought, as he was prone to, very rapidly and with an enthusiasm he communicated in his short letters of thanks to Matisse from 1913 to 1915. So for drawings and prints, it's basically these two years or three years when he's buying. It is not known when Doucet's interest in Matisse was born, though. In 1926, in a letter to his friend and advisor, the writer André Suarez, he compared the four authors on whom the Bibliothèque littéraire was based, André Gide, Paul Claudel, André James, and Guillaume Apollinaire, with his two pillars for uh, art, Matisse and Picasso. He explained that when he was collecting 18th century art, I quote him, however, I had Cézanne, Van Gogh, Degas, Monet, etc. We tend to think that he bought these paintings, these Impressionist paintings in the uh, 1890s. I mean, he started buying in the 1890s, but he bought just one painting by each, or two at most. Um, when I left the 18th century, I jumped to Matisse, Picasso, and following. Coming from you, my friend, who was responsible for my literary departure with Gide Claudel James, I reached Apollinaire 
and those who follow him. So I think we have a very clear picture there. It seems to be at least, that's another view of uh, Doucet's studio where you can see at least one painting by Matisse from 1917. I'll come back to it um, in the center. It was in 1910, if I believe the provenance indicated when it was sold at Sotheby's uh, 10 years ago, that he bought his first Matisse painting. That's another thing about provenance and, and collection. I'm really not a specialist of provenance and collection. That's one of my first um, hints at, at trying to um, work with that. But I discover with a lot of surprise that basically, for instance, on our uh, on the Yenasha da database about Doucet's collection, there is a date which is pretty explicit, saying that the painting was bought in 1910 at Galerie Bernheim Jeune. Then when I tried to understand how it was put that way, I was referred to the, ca the sales catalog by Sotheby's. Then when I asked Sotheby's what it was coming from, they said, we don't remember. So, I mean, yeah. What's the base of these kinds of dates? I, I don't exactly know. I know the painting is from 1909, 1910. That's the only thing I know. Uh, but maybe it is this painting about which Doucet and Matisse and Vignet are speaking in 1913. I, I, I just don't know. I, I, I'm, um, I have no way of knowing. Uh, what I can say is that in a way, it's a nice but rather mild painting. And if it's from that same year, 1910, we could say that, yeah, he could have made better. I mean, maybe what Shukin left, he could have bought it. Maybe that was, was left and available. I don't know. Um, then he bought, maybe around the date of its realization, Femme à la Fontaine from 1917. That's the painting you see on the illustration uh, that I showed before. Um, it's clear that he buys it, if not in 1917 or 18, pretty close to that. Uh, and before 1921, as it is reproduced in Fénéon's interview, he buys Nature Morte, Citron et Mortier from 1919. So there are four paintings, I I'll come back to them. From the sales catalog of his drawing collection from 1917, a sale that occurred in order to raise some money to cover some additional costs for the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie. Um, at the time, it was given away to the French state, to the Paris University. An unfortunate lack of support by the state through the Université de Paris meant that before that date, uh, that, that contrary to what had been decided, the drawing collection was not part of the gift and was sold in order to fund uh, two jobs um, of a keeper for the collections. So I'm, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure I totally agree with uh, Sylvie that, that it's always a good thing to ask the collectors to uh, give the money to run the, um, the places that they, uh, which is going to take care of, of what they've been given. Sometimes it is detrimental, and in that case it's clearly detrimental, because we know um, that before that date, before 1917, Doucet had bought at least five drawings by Matisse. There are five drawings by Matisse for sale in that sale. The sale is about 400 works. It is said that Doucet's collection, which at the time was incorporated into the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie, there were more than 1,000 drawings. There is no catalog for the uh, drawing collection, so we are, I mean, it's very difficult to know exactly so maybe he had more drawings by, um, by Matisse in his collection, but we know at least of five, of which only one I've been able to identify with certainty. I mean, I didn't identify it. I, I just have a reproduction of it. I don't know where it is. I'm very happy if anyone can help me with that. Um, as it was reproduced in the pamphlet, it is not, I mean, it has several brothers and sisters uh, in the Matisse family collection, but it's not the same drawing. Um, we know that Doucet had bought at least three drawings by Matisse in 1913, each one for uh, 150 francs. 
uh, through a bill uh, by Galerie Bernheim Jeune from uh, May 27, 1913. We can imagine that they were uh, bought in the month, in the previous month or two months before. As for the prints, I will come back to them later, but suffice it to say that before 1917, Doucet had bought several dozens of prints by Matisse. With or without Breton's help then, Doucet had thus acquired a significant collection of works by Matisse. Not at all random or conservative if you look at them together, which is not what I did before, but distinguished by a tendency toward abstraction, a redefinition of the traditional genres of painting, still life portrait interior, through scraping, erasing, eliding, that at a time when Matisse were generally considered passé and outmoded, the end of the 1910s, um, engulfed in the bourgeoisie of his niece paintings, showed him as an experimental artist, as experimental, I think, as Picasso, for instance, as new as Picabia, and even the still life with the lemon from 1919, which is technically a Nice painting, is a very uh, daring painting uh, compared to uh, some of its uh, contemporary works. Although a latecomer collector of the artist, he had chosen very carefully and wisely, and I remain really intrigued by what I see as a common feature of these four paintings. A kind, I don't know what to say, after we, what we heard this morning, I wouldn't say mystery, but it has to do with that. We heard that it's what um, art critics and art historians use as a word when they don't know what to say. So it's basically what I don't know uh, about these paintings. I know that they're not very communicative. I know that they're not very explicit. Um, I know that this kind of non-communication is embodied by the black mirror in one still life, by the strip of extreme light and this transformation of extreme light in its contrary so a black stripe uh, in the uh, Poisson Rouge et Palette, the blanked face, erased face of the sitter in what is otherwise a very uh, traditional uh, portrait of a woman, even the isolated flower pot about which I said before that it's mild, modernist, um, is not so far from an object in a metaphysical painting by the Chirico. Um, it has a kind of solitude or something like that. But I must confess, I haven't seen it in the flesh, so I, it's difficult to judge from, uh, from, ja from that. It must be emphasized that you can't find much archival material about Doucet's activities in life. A few letters and bills in the INHA archives by him or his collaborators René Jean or Clément Janin, the same kind of material in the Matisse archives, a more extensive correspondence at the Bibliothèque littéraire Jacques Doucet, but only with, with writers, and the correspondence kept by René Jean in the manuscript department of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Hence, everything I can say now is provisional and comes from recent research conducted in these archives with the help of the chief curator of special collections at INHA, Caroline Fieschi, the curator in charge of modern print collection, Nathalie Muller, and an intern, Capucine Montfort, whom I want to thank heartily. In the collection of Yenacha Jacques Doucet, but we don't know when each item was acquired, the first exhibition pamphlet on Matisse dates from 1906. So if it was, I mean, we have to do some research, if we can find, if it dates, if it is coming from Doucet, it would mean that Doucet started being interested in, 19, uh, in Matisse in 1906. But it could come from someone else. So, I mean, for, what we, for uh, as much as we know. But when René Jean, who was the director, the first director of the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie, wrote a memorandum to Doucet about the creation of a cabinet de dessin d'artistes contemporains, certainly around 1908, when he was hired as a librarian, the name of Matisse didn't appear. Instead, we find the contemporary schools who show some vitality can be summed up with the names that follow. Masters in the classical spirit as such, Benard first, the Impressionists, the Neo-Impressionists, and every time you see a name and you look at the, the names he puts, 
after the, the movement, you can see that he's not very precise, that you have people who really don't fit. Les intim the intimists, by that he means more or less the Nabi group. The group from the uh, Salon d'Automne with uh, very various tendencies. And at last, the Cubist movement, it exists. And at least from the viewpoint of history, we have to take it into account. Uh, there are, um, anyway, uh, some drawings by some of these art Cubist artists who, uh, which wouldn't disfigure any collection. The names who come to mind um, are, and he mixes everything, Picasso, Marquet, Triez, Charmy. I don't even know who Charmy is, I must confess. Vlaminck, de la Frenet. So it's a very conservative and an under-informed view of contemporary art, indeed. And in Clément Janin's similar exercise for the print collection in 1911, which is titled Exposé de quelques idées générales concernant le cabinet des stampes modernes de la Bibliothèque d'art et d'archéologie, the name of Matisse doesn't appear either, alongside those who seem to be the basis of this collection, which will have, says Clément Janin, a double function of um, teaching and encouraging younger artists. And he, he gives a list also. Odilon Redon, Vierge, Bredin, Maurice Denis, Steinlein, Viala, Frello. So it's really a, a mixed bag of, of artists from the, late, from the mid 19th century to uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century. In fact, the name Matisse doesn't appear in the manuscript catalog of the print collection established by Clément Janin at an unknown date. Um, but just to give you an idea of the scope of the print collection, um, when Clément Janin started working for Doucet in September 1911, uh, the print collection in the library was of uh, 2,616 prints. At the end of December of that same year, Clément Janin had bought 1,409 prints. Uh, so the, the collection that was assembled right before the First World War was enormous and, and grew very, very rapidly. In October 1913, it is in October 1913, so it's always the same kind of dates, that according to bills preserved at Yenasha and in the Matisse archives, the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie then began acquiring an important number of prints not less than 24 at the time. I mean, it's difficult to, to know very precisely. I'll come back to that. Um, for Matisse, it is very clear that the Bibliothèque d'Art and d'Archéologie and Jacques Doucet as a person appear to have been totally indistinguishable. Uh, as, for instance, in the letter to Doucet from November 1913, he speaks about a new series of lithographs that the collector might want to buy, as well as about the possible acquisition of a new painting. Um, there is a whole story, but I, I won't go into that detail about um, buying some prints for the um, civil prison prisoners of Bois en Vendemois, the birthplace of Matisse, uh, under German occupation during the First World War. Um, we know that uh, Doucet bought at least uh, 13 prints and maybe a little bit more, but unfortunately I have no images of these, so I... I uh, it didn't work for various reasons linked with protecting data and, and everything. Um, so I'm only showing you, I mean, this is part of, of one of these prints, and one of them is misdated. We now that the library continued to acquire prints by Matisse after Doucet stopped buying for it. It is interesting that the artist kept giving ensembles of his prints to the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie, at least in three installments, January... 1926, or a little bit earlier at the end of 1925, um, in 1930, and in 1931. This last gift, consisting, according to one of the curators, Clotilde Brière, um, in 90 prints. It is not clear, though, if she doesn't speak about the sum total of gifts by the artist. These gifts were facilitated by the implication or the participation of Georges Dutuy, Matisse's son-in-law, uh, in the activities of the Friends of the Library d'Archéologie. And they show that Matisse remained 
strongly attached to Doucet, even after his death in 1929, and was also, for a time at least, paying attention to the completeness of uh, this collection of prints, which now contains 162 prints by Matisse. We are trying to sort out which ones are coming from Doucet, which ones are coming from Matisse. I'm, I mean, with the material we have, we know we can't succeed in, in completely clearing the uh, situation, not counting bound collections and books. Um, so that in the 1930s, and that appears in, in one of these articles that I'm, I'm reproducing here, um, the idea was that all the printed of, of Matisse was in the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie. But apparently, the Bibliothèque d'Art et d'Archéologie didn't pay much attention to what Matisse was given. You can see that first they're sending very nice letters, very precise and, and personal, and soon they started, I mean, the last gift, they just, we just have one letter from the president of the Sorbonne, uh, typed just saying, we acknowledge the gift of 90 prints and we thank you. Uh, and that's about it. And in the 1940s, Matisse switches to the Bibliothèque littéraire Jacques Doucet. So we have the same. I, I just wanted to end with that, just uh, for the fun of making parallels with uh, Shukin and collection. That now we have a divided collection. Part of it is in the Bibliothèque de l'Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art slash Collection Jacques Doucet. The other one is in the collection of the Bibliothèque littéraire uh, Jacques Doucet, always with um, dedication to um, Jacques Doucet through the library. And I'm not sure Matisse was very conscious it was not the same library. I, I doubt he, he really understood that, the, the difference. Um, it must be stressed that the number of artists who were collected as extensively by Doucet and his library is very limited. Picasso, for instance, was not treated in the same way and the fact that he wasn't particularly prolific in this realm until much later, I, I mean uh, Prince, is not a sufficient re reason. As we can see in Clément Janin's letter to Matisse, the curators who were tending to all this were not particularly familiar with the artist's work, nor particularly enthusiastic. My guess is that it was Doucet who felt a particular interest for Matisse as a printer, as a draftsman, as a painter, as he did uh, for any artist he collected. Thank you. <laughs>